Hello, Tastorians. Happy Sunday. Can you all hear me? Can you all see me? It's from Harry Potter. Is it working? We got it? Comments? Wrong. All right, cool. Uh, well, today we're making election cake in honor of our presidential election coming up on Tuesday. Um, hope everyone had a wonderful Halloween. Uh, we did. We didn't do anything except watch some scary movies, which I don't really like, and ate pizza, which I do like, and handed out zero candy. Zip. We didn't get any trick-or-treaters. Did anyone get any trick-or-treaters? I don't know. We never get any trick-or-treaters, though, so I don't think, I'm not blaming it on anything other than that we live in a condo. Um, cool. So Jose is going to be monitoring the comments today. Uh, I implore you to make his job a little bit easier by keeping everything history and food-based and talking about the wonderful elections of 1755 and 1826. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that for today. Make his life easy, I beg you. Um, all right. So we're going to go into the history of election cake, but first let's get it started because this does take a little bit of time to make. That said, we are doing a modern, a modernized version because, and we'll get into it, but the original cake would take days to make um, rather than an hour. And since this is a live stream, that's not really doable. But let's get to it. All right, so I am basing this off of Fanny Farmer's the Boston Cooking School Cookbook from 1896, um, which I have right here. So what we'll need is one half cup of butter, or one stick for us Americans. Uh, you want that softened. Really, everything should be at about room temperature. Um, it's not going to kill you if it's not, but it, it does help. So uh, there is that, and then two eggs, which I actually have been keeping in here just to Leave it room temperature. Uh, two eggs, pre-cracked. Don't microwave your eggs. Um, one cup or 200 grams of brown sugar. Definitely stick to brown sugar. Uh, I'm using dark brown sugar. Either that or light brown sugar will work. Don't use regular sugar for this. Uh, it'll, it'll come out too dry. You don't want that. Um, two thirds cup raisins and eight finely chopped dried figs. If you have fresh figs, you can use those. Um, they're, they're gonna be fine. They're a little bit more moist because they're not dried, um, but they, it actually works. I've, 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 it'll work either way, but you want them finely chopped. If you're using huge raisins as well, you actually wanna chop those too. You don't want anything too, too big, but just a regular old like sun-made raisin, that's fine. You don't need to chop them. Then we need one and two thirds cup or 210 grams of flour. All purpose flour is fine. You can use pastry flour uh, for this as well. Whole wheat, whole wheat pastry flour is actually really great for this, um, but you can also use just plain all purpose flour. And then our raising agents. And this is, this is where things are going to differ from, from the original recipes. And I'll talk about that. We're going to use one uh, we'll go with a one half teaspoon of baking powder. Uh, sorry, one teaspoon of baking powder, and one half teaspoon of baking soda. If you like my new bowls? It's got these. Um, hey Max, can yes. you substitute the brown sugar for white sugar and molasses. You can substitute the brown sugar, brown sugar for white sugar and molasses. Um, it it kind of throws off the the uh, the measurements exactly. So. You want to cut back a little bit on, on maybe another liquid that you're going to be using. Um, just don't use too, you don't need too much molasses. If you add probably, I'd say, two tablespoons of molasses in there, that's actually fine. Then you don't have to change anything else. Just add a couple tablespoons of molasses, it'll be fine. Um, can everyone hear Jose when he talks? I think that we've figured it out. I'm using a better camera. I'm using a better microphone than our previous live streams. So hopefully that's showing. Um, so let me know if you cannot hear him because then I'll just repeat everything that he says. And then a teaspoon of salt, regular old salt. Um, and then spices, which is really what this cake is all about. We're doing a 
calls for one teaspoon of cinnamon ground up. Uh, I pre-ground everything. A quarter teaspoon of cloves. Do not use more than a quarter teaspoon. If you want to add more of any spices, great. Don't add any more cloves. They're already pretty strong in the cake. Um, one quarter teaspoon of mace. That's actually the one that I would add a little bit more if I could. And then as John Townsend would always double this, we're doing one quarter teaspoon of nutmeg, uh, grated nutmeg. He'd probably use a half teaspoon or more. Um, and that would be okay. He loves his nutmeg. And then buttermilk. So one half cup or 118 milliliters of buttermilk. So the buttermilk is, if, if anyone makes like soda bread, like Irish soda bread, the way that it usually gets its leavening is from buttermilk and baking soda, which is what we have. And that is in the original recipe. The acid uh, and the baking soda, they, you know, create a leavening. But the original recipe and most of the early recipes for this were made before there were a lot of leaveners, quality leaveners at least. And so it was a sourdough yeasted cake. I tried them. They're... People today, they're not, they're not the most popular thing. One, because they're a lot of work, but two, they tend to not have the, that cake-like or, or even bread-like quality that we want. Um, one of these days, I'm, I'm, I should do it. Maybe in four years, uh, I'll do another, I'll do Amelia Simmons election cake and we'll get into that. Um, but it, it takes days, days to make. So that is why I have added the one teaspoon of baking powder. Seems like a lot, but it works. And then we'll get into the whiskey sauce later. Uh, you can also do a brandy sauce. Just swap out the whiskey for the brandy. Just real quick, you have a thousand people watching along. A thousand. And you have uh, quite a few people sending your love, starting with Juan Carlo, who is our local neighbor. Ah. Fluffy Monkey. Thank you, Fluffy Monkey. Thank you, Juan Carlo. Senor, Mr. Giggles. <laughs> Thank you, Senor, Mr. Giggles. And the Senor and Mr. Giggles. Oh, Senor and Mr. Giggles. <laughs> And then Felix asked for a Valentine's Day if you could make a capizzoli. You can marry. Capizzoli. I'm going to have to look that one up for Valentine's Day. Um, yeah, I haven't actually started to plan out. I pretty much got the rest of the year planned uh, what I'm going to be doing. But starting January 1st, I'm taking suggestions. So if you got suggestions, don't leave them in the, in the feed because I will probably never um, get to see it. But send me an email or shoot me a... Instagram message or, or Twitter message. Um, that's going to be the best way to do it. Taking suggestions. All right. So let's do this. So what we first need to do is mix together our dry ingredients. And it's super easy. This cake is actually super easy to make the way that I'm doing it. So you take the flour, dump that in there. Oh, if you haven't turned on your oven, turn on your oven. I kind of like these. I, I love the look of my wooden bowls, but they um, they tend to like hold. They're, they're hard to get some of the ingredients out. So I kind of like these nice smooth ones. They're terracotta on the outside. And then all of your spices. We've got our nutmeg. I'm going backwards here. Get all of you out. We've got our mace. Da, da, da. Uh, so how many, I'm, I'm curious how many people are actually making this a few days and then whisk all of these together. So the, uh, the first recipe that we have for something called election cake actually comes from Amelia Simmons' American Cookery, which is often satirical writers coming out of Yale University who were writing satire uh, at, at first the government in Connecticut, but later on they were Connecticut form of government to be adopted uh, as part of the U.S. Constitution and, and making up their laws as, as a colony. Um, and we're going to get into going way, way back uh, to um, why they were... This cake is really associated with Hartford. That will actually start not with Hartford, but with Massachusetts. Um, then we need a big bowl. You can do this by hand. I don't suggest it, uh, but I'm going to use my stand mixer because I got it. And mix basically everything else together, but we have to do it in a certain order. So what you want to do is add your sugar, powdered sugar. It's French for some reason today. And your butter. And really, if I had been prepared, 
I would have sliced this butter up. You want it room temperature, but even if you don't put the whole stick in there, I'd slice it into maybe, you know, like tablespoons. So between four and eight little we're getting lagging issues. slices. Lagging issues. Is it lagging? Is my voice not matched with the, the video? Is that what it is? I think it's just freezing. Harumph. Is there any way to lower the ability? I don't know what that means, lower the ability. I wonder if it's our internet. We have terrible internet. For some reason, all of like Los Angeles County now has fiber pretty much, except for Burbank. No fiber for us. We get the worst internet. Um, I'm gonna keep going on and hopefully the lagging isn't too, too bad. Uh, so we want to cream this together. So butter and sugar, just cream it together um, until it's nice and smooth. Probably not, probably can pick this up, so I'll try not to uh, talk about anything too important while this is going on. I did want to um, mention that a bunch of people have asked me to make merchandise, um, and I've been putting it off. It's, you know, uh, something I haven't done, but... I finally got some up. Um, it's You can see it actually below uh, the video. But I'm kind of curious what people want. Um, there's a really, I think it's really cool that you can get aprons and uh, shirts and stuff with the, the garum bottle on it and with that painting that is at the end of my opening, which is called Der Füller, with the rotund gentleman who keeps eating. Um, so... Let me know, you know, what else you, you, you'd like to see, because because I'm curious. How are the lagging issues? Uh, it's, it's gotten a little better. Uh, the Asians. And uh, Jordy and her husband love your show. And has anyone told you that you look like Rich from Community? A lot of people have told me that I look like Rich from Community. I, I didn't know who that was until I started getting comments. And we actually started watching it because everyone was like, you look like Rich from Community. Um, and I don't mind that, because he's a good looking fella. All right. So once the butter and sugar is beat in, then just add your eggs. But really, it's always a good plan to, I'm going to use a buttered knife, to break them up, give them a little whisk, um, just to kind of mix them before they go in. It's not obligatory, but any pastry chef would, would say, do this. I'm not a pastry chef, but uh, I watch a lot of pastry chef do things, and I learn from them. I try to learn from them. So add your eggs, and then mix. You want to mix until fairly well incorporated. Not very difficult, but there it is. Um, and then add in your buttermilk. When you add this in, it might look curdled. Uh, especially if your buttermilk is cold. It might look curdled, and that's okay. It does not matter. Um, it's fine. It will not look curdled later on. I promise. We mix that in until well incorporated. And then we mix in our fruits. Uh, I got my figs and a uh, little piece left, and my raisins. So um, one, one thing about election day cake is, you know, we're making this for our presidential election, but when election day cake started, we didn't have a president. So it was actually not even done in uh, November. So first we have to figure out what is election day when it comes to election day cake. And for that, we have to go back to two traditions of election day and muster day or training day. So the holiday, and it was a holiday, though they wouldn't have called it a holiday because they were completely anti-holiday. 
the Puritans in, uh, when they came to New England, brought this tradition of muster day, uh, which is used to happen in England when in a small town, all of the local militiamen would come together uh, once or twice a year and, and train. So it was also training day, not the Denzel Washington movie, but maybe it comes from the same place. I don't know. Um, and, and so they brought that tradition over because the Puritans did not have Easter or New Year's or birthdays or Christmas or any lovely holidays. They were all... Um, nice. for, is this mustard day? No, muster. So like when a um, mustard day is a totally different holiday. Uh, no, muster day, M-U-S-T-E-R. So that would be like when, when a militia musters or, or uh, a regiment musters, it means they, they all come together and get ready and present. Um, and, and it can actually mean different things at different times in history, specifically with regarding different military units and everything. But in this case, it would mean that they came together, presented themselves, and readied themselves to train. Uh, and surely the training was more than a day? I don't know. Maybe not. Because um, I, I imagine that it's hard to fire, learn how to fire a musket, um, which is what they would have been fighting with at the time. Anyway. We're going to do this next part by hand. So as you can see, kind of looks, looks kind of gross. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's, it's kind of mottled. But as soon as we take our dry ingredients and put them in, the mottling goes away and it'll look nice and smooth. But before we do that, we have to prepare our pan. The best thing to do to prepare a, a bread pan, and you can use a cake pan or bread loaf. These would have been served in loaves like this. Um, you can also double the recipe and use like a bundt cake. They wouldn't have done that, but it's much prettier, but I'm going to use a standard bread loaf pan. Um, and I'm going to cheat and use this uh, baking with flour pan stuff. But the best thing to do is actually put butter on the inside, thin thing of butter, then put, dump out the flour and then freeze it for about 15 minutes. That's the best thing to get stuff to not stick. But I didn't remember to do that, so I'm using I'm cheating. There you go. Anyway, muster day. Where was I? So when they would when they would get so they brought the 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 tradition of muster day to the new world, uh, to new New England, and that was their equivalent of a holiday, muster day and election day, because they would elect certain certain members of their their groups in the different. Uh, you know, they, you had Boston and Braintree and all of these little areas were very, very separated. And they would elect different people um, once a year to kind of re represent them. And we can actually see this in the very closing scene of the Scarlet Letter. If you've ever read the Scarlet Letter, um, the, the last scene is it's election day. And oh, what was his name? Dimsdale, who was... Spoiler alert, uh, he was the one who had the illegitimate child with Hester Prynne, who had the scarlet letter, the A. Well, he was also the minister. So he was giving what was known as the election day sermon or the election sermon. And they were a big deal. They were long and kind of rambling because while obviously that's a fake one because it's, you know, a book, uh, we have... Election day, so I'm adding the dry ingredients. You can do this in one or two. It's probably better to do it in two, but I just did it in one. And then fold it in. You don't want to work it very um, hard. That's why you want to do this part by hand uh, rather than with a, with a machine. Um, so anyway, we have one of these long-winded sermons. We actually have a bunch of them from 17... Uh, sorry, 1676, an election day sermon by Increase Mather, who was the father of Cotton Mather, who was uh, much more well-known. But Increase Mather gave one of these. He was in Boston on election day. And just the title of this sermon was, Big Breath, an earnest exhortation to the inhabitants of New England to hearken to the voice of God in his late and present dispensations as ever they desire to escape a, another judgment seven times greater than anything which has 
which as yet hath been. That's the title. The sermon goes on for quite some time. It was actually published in a, in a local uh, publication at the time. It's like 30 pages. It's long. Um, Max, I have two questions for you. Two questions. Edward asks, uh, do you need to sift the flour? You can always sift the flour. It's good to sift the flour. You don't need to with this. Um, if you're making something really delicate like pastry or cookies, I would always sift the flour. With breads and even cakes like this, you don't need to. If you're making something like, like a chiffon cake, you definitely want to sift it. Um, but with this one, it's, it's, it's just not going to, you're not going to notice a difference. Um, so now that we have that. And the second question was, would you compare this to a fruit cake? I would not compare it to a fruit, fruit cake. It's not going to be as dense. I would actually compare this the way that we are making it closer to like banana bread should have more that consistency, um, not as dense. There isn't nearly as much fruit as a fruit cake, first of all. Um, the original recipes that were leavened with sourdough, they're going to be a lot more dense. Again, still not like a fruit cake, but more like bread, um, more like a fruit bread. A little bit like the soul cakes that if you, if you watch the episode on soul cakes that came out on Friday, more of that texture, a little bit chewier, less, less cake-like. So it's election cake, but the term cake then, we would, not, we would be very disappointed in um, if you've ever had leavened cakes that way. They, they just aren't the same as our modern leaveners. So I'm going to put this, I'm going to spoon this in here. You're probably not gonna be able to see it because I don't have three hands, um, but that's what we're going to do. Anyway, so now we have election day. Uh, that was going to be in May. That's when they tended to, to hold it, was election day was always in May. And that was the case with all of the colonies uh, in New England that had election day ceremonies. They started to, we have been having cakes at these, but the Puritans, not huge on the cakes, not huge on the drinking. But as, you know, as less... As the colonies changed from being all Puritan to a little bit more mixed as more English settlers came over, they brought the idea of adding cake and they really brought the idea of adding booze. And election day ended up becoming a drunken festival of sorts. They would still have the sermon, they would still have the election, they would still count the votes, but then afterward, they would usually have a big ball big party, everybody would get drunk. Um, there are actually, uh, there are stories that they would, the, the people would get so drunk that by the time the governor was elected, people were just passing out, uh, kind, of, kind of a mess. Um, and, and we'll get into that more as well. All right, so I'm smoothing it out. I don't want to, it is smooth, it's not so easy. Now I have it on my finger as well. Um, there it is. There is our election cake batter, because it is more of a batter than anything else. And then we just pop it in the oven for about 50 minutes. Uh, you really want to, you know, everybody's oven is different. It's going to be about 45 to 55 minutes. I would start checking it at about 45 um, because you, want it, you, want it, you don't want it to dry out but you want it to be done in the center. So take a, a wooden skewer or, or a knife and stick it in the center at about 45 minutes. And if it pulls out clean, then it's done. If it does not pull out clean, then it is not done. Keep it baking. Can you set, I'll set it. I will set an alarm for 55 minutes. The thing is, we're not gonna be here for 55 minutes. I promise, uh, sorry, 45 minutes. I promise, I actually, movie magic, I baked one earlier, so. I'm going to be icing that one uh, so you don't have to sit here and wait for 45 minutes. Anyway, um, let's get back to elections. So these election cakes started really getting popular in Hartford, and they ended up becoming very associated with Hartford etiquette. Uh, the first actual mention that we have of an election day 
cake doesn't come until 1771. We know that they were doing this long before that, but in 1771, from the Connecticut uh, General Assembly's notes, they were repaying an Ezekiel Williams two pounds, sh seven shillings and nine pence for the raisins, clove, mace, sugar, etc., for the cake. And they were paying another two pounds, five shillings to Miss Leslie for making it. Now, if you know anything about money in the 18th century, that is a lot of money. It's hard to, uh, to make an exact, you know, currency translation. It's the word I'm looking for. I don't know. It was between $1,200 and $1,800 for this cake because it was a huge cake. So I'm going to read you one of the, or the first recipe that we have from 1796 from American Cookery, the second edition. So the first edition did not have this. Most people, that's what you're going to usually find if you buy this book. You're going to have the first edition. This cake will not be in there. But in the second edition, she calls for 30 quarts flour, 10 pounds butter, 14 pounds of sugar, 12 pounds of raisins, three dozen eggs, one pint of wine, one quart of brandy, four ounces of cinnamon, four ounces fine colander seed or coriander, uh, three ounces of allspice, then wet the flour and mix the consistency of bread overnight. Add a quart of yeast. So this is why it takes days, because then you also have to have the yeast. A quart of yeast, which is the sourdough, the next morning, then work in the butter and sugar for half an hour, which will render the cake much lighter and whiter. When it has risen, work every, in every other ingredient except the plums. Back then, plums simply meant dried fruits, hence uh, the raisins, which work uh, in when going into the oven. So that is a big cake. And it actually probably would have been made into 12 smaller cakes because these cakes were, were meant to feed an entire community. It wasn't, you, you didn't have this cake just for your house all of the women of a community would come together and bake these cakes and give them out on election day. Because the election day had people coming in from all, other, all the other villages and they would come into one, one town and have to stay the night, sometimes a couple nights. And so this cake was kind of a way to, to welcome everyone. And uh, you know, it was part of the festivities. They actually had other baked goods from the time period from the late 1700s uh, that had very patriotic names um, like Franklin gingerbread, democratic tea, tea cakes, small d, independence cake. They were, you know, it was, it was brand new democracy, um, brand new country. So they were very, very patriotic and excited about that, which I think we should, I wanna make that Franklin gingerbread. That's, that's something I wanna make. Um, there is a really cool, so there's a historian that, um, I actually have a link to his book called Creating Connecticut down in the description of this video. If you want to learn more about Connecticut history, you should get it. There's also a lot in there about election cake. He's fantastic. Uh, William, uh, Walter Woodward is his name. And he found in a Hartford Current article from 1867 titled A Hartford Lady's Reminiscences, uh, a description of what election day used to be like. Now she's, so this is in the 1860s. She's talking about elections back in like the 1820s. Um, and she says, and I'm shortening this. It's very, very long. It's a whole article. So I'm shortening this and it's still gonna be, take me a minute to read. Will someone who remembers it all tell about election in old times in Hartford? How every house was in, how every house was in apple pie order. Summer arrangements all completed. I love that, apple pie order. And everything was, you know, put, put in its place. There was a grand ball in the evening then. And in those times, too, there was an election sermon preached at the meeting house. Oh, the quantities of cake. A batch of election cake was 12 loaves. But there, but there had to be many more than one batch and plenty of sponge cake with it. The best clothes go on as soon as possible after breakfast. White frock, to be sure, new bonnet, pink sash, and the red shoes. I left my bonnet and pink, pink sash upstairs. Shame on me. Lots of money to spend. Children could have a cent any time they asked for it on election day. And cake, a big piece, not a, not a slice, every time they would run into the house. Nobody dared refuse them. 
It stands ready all day for wagons full of country friends and acquaintances come to see the parade. All must eat loaf cake and tell what luck they had with theirs. If you go to the neighbors, you must eat a piece, of course. It is next in importance to the governor and the stars and stripes. And wherever there is a Connecticut man or woman, man especially, not sure why, because they only had the vote probably, uh, there is one who will not refuse a piece of election cake. And there are recipes from the 1800s. Everybody's cake was a little bit different. So there isn't a standard election cake because um, in, in one collection of recipes, you've got 20 different, different election cakes, all a little bit different. You've got Miss Rebecca Butler's election cake, Mrs. Lewis Welds, Mrs. Nathaniel Terry, and Mrs. Henry Hudson. I think it's so, I, I think it's so weird still that they would basically just give up their name first and last in writing when they got married, Mrs. Henry Hudson. I don't know. Glad we don't do that anymore. Um, what's interesting about Connecticut elections is that starting in 1755, there were two sets of elections and there were two governors. And it went all the way pretty much up until the Civil War because there was a white election with a white governor and a black election with a black governor. And it, it was, of course, largely um, ceremonial, but it was actually a, a big deal at the time. It didn't happen anywhere else. Uh, it, was, it was just in Connecticut, and Connecticut was on the forefront, not in 1755, but, but soon after of, of abolition and everything. And the history around the uh, around the black governors is really interesting because sometimes sometimes you read about it and it's like oh this is you know this this is a step in the right direction and then sometimes you read about it and they were often used by uh, by the the rest of the people um, to it in in less than than nice ways to kind of um, keep keep order and everything. But it's a fascinating subject. And uh, I, I encourage you to, to look it up because it's a part of American history that I had no idea about. Um, it's just, it's an interesting time. So in that same year that they started uh, those, um, the, the two elections, 1755, down in the House of Burgesses in Virginia, they were having elections. And this has nothing to do with election day cake because they did not celebrate election day the same way that they did in, in uh, New England and they didn't have cake. But the story of this election and the following election is so great. Um, I just had to share it. So in May of 1755, uh, when he heard about an open seat in the House of Burgesses down in Virginia, George Washington, who was fighting in the uh, French and Indian War, I believe at the time, uh, wrote to his brother, his brother John, I should be glad if you could come at Colonel Fairfax's intentions and let me know whether he proposes to offer himself as a candidate. If he does not, I should be glad to take a poll if I thought my chance tolerably good. So he wanted to be in the House of Burgesses. Makes sense. And his brother and his friends ended up kind of, you know, putting his name out there and, and trying to get him uh, to be elected that December. Though Washington wasn't actually there for the vote. And the votes then were taken by voice. So you knew what people voted as, and they would write them down on a piece of paper. And there were three people running. Hugh West, who received 271 votes. Tom Swearingen, 270. And George Washington, the great George Washington, 40 votes. Wiped out. Did not win. So, you know, you can... <laughs> You can feel good that if, if at first you do not succeed, try, try again. Obviously, George Washington uh, did pretty well for himself. So he ended up keeping that, that paper that had everybody's vote and how they voted on it for the rest of his life. Uh, first, I was like, oh, that seems a little petty. But I think it was actually maybe like as a, I'm going to show you kind of thing, you know, it was an um, encouragement for him. Um, a few years later, in November of uh, 1757, he decided to run again when another seat opened up. And he still wasn't in Virginia at the time, but he had a plan. He sent his friends a bunch of money. And they campaigned around Frederick County, plying the voters. And remember, there are only like 600 people in the county who can vote because you have to be a, uh, a male who owns land, property owner. 
they plied them with 46 gallons of beer, 40 gallons, one hogshead, one barrel and 10 bowls of rum punch, 35 gallons of wine, two gallons of cider, and three and a half pints of brandy. And when the result came in on July 24th, 1758, George Washington won with 370, 307 votes. So he learned what the people want. Um, and, you know, now we would be like, well, that, that doesn't really seem, seem right. But that was tame in comparison with what was happening in elections around the same time in other parts of the country. In New York City, it was customary for the, the people who were being, uh, who were up for office, the candidates, to be there at the polls as people came onto the green to vote and heckle them and badger them and <laughs> yell like horrible stuff. Um, and, and then whoever won had to take all of the voters to a nearby tavern and treat them to drinks, regardless of how the voters ended up voting. Uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe we should bring that, that back. Do we have questions? Uh, people are asking about a cooking book cookbook. It is forthcoming. Uh, I can't give any details about it, but I am working on it. Um, there's going to be something, still kind of figuring out exactly what it's going to be, but it will come. I promise you that. People are always curious about the Pokemon. What's your favorite? <laughs> so today's Pokemon, so there was no like American Pokemon or election Pokemon. So we have election Electabuzz over here. Um, He's adorable, but definitely not my favorite Pokemon. I, I've got to go with Blastoise or Blastoise, um, but I say Blastoise. I also like Whalmer and Snorlax. I like the big, like, Pokemon. I don't know why. <laughs> I find them less, uh, less intimidating. <laughs> um, all right. So the next thing we need to do is make our icing. And for that, we need, now you can do this again by hand. I'm going to use my uh, electric mixer for it, but it's super, super easy. And the amounts don't really, you can vary them, uh, kind of depending on what, on what you want to do. Um, depending on how, how liquidy you want. If you want it more like a thick sauce or like a frosting, you can do that. Or if you want it more like a glaze, you can do that. The thing is, the closer to a glaze you get, the more alcoholic it's going to be. The closer to a frosting, the less alcoholic it's going to be. You can also make this non-alcoholic um, by just using milk instead of uh, whiskey or brandy. And note that the early election cakes used to actually have a lot of alcohol in them, they would uh, often like have it sit for a day or so and pour alcohol over it and let it soak in and pour some alcohol over it and let it soak in. As we get through the 19th century, in New England, there starts to be a lot more um, kind of this idea of temperance. You know, it was kind of the precursor to the 1920s when they had prohibition. That whole idea is coming about. And so all of these election cakes, which used to be huge, now they're being baked by a single person in their household. So they're much smaller and they get rid of the alcohol typically. But there's still often alcohol in the glaze and that's why we're making this. Anyway, two cups, 240 grams of powdered sugar. They would have had powdered sugar in the 1890s, though it would have been a little bit different than our powdered sugar today, but it is what it is. And then one teaspoon of vanilla, and you can use more than that if you want, and you just pour it right in. I wouldn't use much more than that, but a little bit. And then three tablespoons, I'm using three tablespoons and probably gonna add some more of uh, whiskey or brandy. I actually decided today to use brandy because we're out of whiskey. And then, again, you can do it by hand or you're gonna lose, you, you can use an electric mixer and that's what I'm gonna be doing. Da, da, da. And do it slow at first because it is powdered sugar and it will go everywhere. So as you can see, it's, maybe you can't see, as you can see, it's coming together and, um, and will eventually become rather thick. And this, so this amount of 
uh, liquor that I put in is perfect for like a frosting. If you want to, you could either kind of spoon it on uh, with a spatula or a spoon, um, or you could put it into a bag and pipe it on. That'd be lovely. If you want it more like a glaze, just start adding alcohol or cream or milk. Either one will work. So I'm going to add a little bit because I want it a little bit more like a glaze. We'll just take some brandy here. Do you have a song to go for that with that whiskey? I don't have a song to go with that whiskey. I, I don't know what I'm trying to think of. What's a good election day song? I really don't know. Um, but I think that this is, a, you know, I think that election day cake is something that really should come back. We should have election day cake at the polls. Um, what's also interesting about election day, uh, the early election day, is often, you know, the election and the counting and everything would happen all at once. And it would happen, you know, out loud and everyone would be there. It's a lot easier when you have, you know, when you're a, a small town or, or village and, like, 10% of the population can vote because you had to be of a certain age and you had to be a landholder and you had to be male and you had to be white. So, you know, you have 5,000 people, but only maybe 200 could vote. You can go a lot quicker. But I, I just love the idea of, you know, that, that tradition happening. I guess it's just kind of outdated and quaint, but I think it's interesting. So what, what is interesting too is that When, when they ended up moving election day, so first they moved election day from May to, uh, <clears throat> so presidential election day was always, um, you know, was November, but election day, what they still considered election day in Connecticut and much of New England was still in May, all through the, the 1800s until they started changing in the mid 1800s. And I think Hartford and Connecticut did it in like 1871 might not be right. Uh, they changed it to January. And well, now it's too cold to have any of these outside festivities. And it was right after Christmas, because by now they're celebrating Christmas and, and New Year's and everything. And so they didn't, the festivities kind of fell apart and the parades didn't happen anymore. But they, they said, you know, the one thing that we're keeping is election cake. And they did keep it for a while. But as an influx of new people from Europe started coming in, in, you know, the 1890s and the early 1900s, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't important to this, to this, it wasn't part of their tradition. So the tradition of election cake kind of faded away. And really by the 19 teens and 1920s, you stop seeing election cake in, in a lot of cookbooks. Um, it's kind of sad. Plus, and right, right about the time that Fanny Farmer, and I should do a show on, on, on her, um, is writing her cookbook in 1896, the way that cooking in the household was, was changing because now you've got kind of a burgeoning middle class that can, they can't afford uh, to have a, a maid or, or servants cooking because most cookbooks during the 19th century had kind of been written for that for, for someone who was cooking all day, uh, that was their job. They couldn't really afford that. So now it's for the housewife. And that's what the Boston Cooking School was for. It was to teach housewives how to cook. Uh, so things are starting to change. Recipes are getting a lot smaller. Um, and then not long after that, World War I, women start kind of entering the workforce. And it's, it's interesting to see how cookbooks through the late 19th century and early 20th century change as, as society changes. And that, that, yeah, that could be a whole episode. Um, I won't go into it all right now, but um, it's just interesting, you know. Hey, Max, uh, Yami sent you the good guy to wine from your Amazon wish list and Ooh. sends her a drink. Thank you, Yami. I, I can't wait to, uh, to get that. There are actually a few books I need to look into. Okay, so this... Once you take your cake out of the oven, it would be like this. Um, you want to let it cool in the pan for about five 
maybe 10 minutes, and then you want to flip it out onto a uh, wire rack. At which point, if you want a glaze, you can actually put a little bit of glaze on there while it's still warm, but I would wait until it's, it's pretty much room temperature. Otherwise it can slide off and it's not pretty. But I'm going to just, um, I'm gonna just pour this on here. See, see, what, see what happens. It's still pretty, pretty thick. Can you see? Still pretty thick. But I'm putting it on there. It's like ribbons almost. I love that uh, <laughs> and this was totally not on purpose, but the, um, it's plenty. You need to save a little bit and put it on an individual piece maybe. Um, so there, as you, as you see, election day cake. It's all ready. I'm gonna cut myself a slice because I haven't eaten this, clearly. I ate it earlier, but I haven't eaten this one. Um, what was I saying? I was saying something. I just ramble. Uh, I honestly can't remember what I was saying. I don't know. It'll come back to me. Let me grab a knife here. Can you talk a little bit about what's coming for November, December? Yes, I can talk about what's coming for November and December. So for November, well, on Tuesday, this Tuesday, on the real election day, um, I have an episode that a lot of people have been asking about, which is Silphium. I talk about Silphium and go into the history of that lost Roman aphrodisiac, uh, Silphium. Really interesting history. I've also been maybe toying with some mead making. Uh, we've got some pumpkin pie from the 17th century coming. Some interesting history there. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of holiday recipes. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to do every single episode a holiday recipe, save some for next year. Hopefully I'm still around. Um, but I'm not saying I'm gonna be dead. I'm saying <laughs> hopefully the show is still around. <laughs> This is a little morbid, um, but you know, I'm probably going to be doing gingerbread and <laughs> one thing. So I had some mishaps with uh, Christmas pudding, the first recipe for something actually called Christmas pudding. Before that, it was plum pit pudding or figgy pudding. But for Christmas pudding, uh, it needs to be boiled in a cloth and it is hard and so easy to mess up. And I messed up and had some very expensive um, mishaps. So I'm going to cut this cake. Hey Max, Chris asks if you can add food coloring to that glaze so you can make it look like an American flag. Absolutely you can. You can add food coloring to everything. So. Okay. So I didn't want to um, completely change the texture of the cake. I wanted it to be, you know, akin to what a yeasted cake is going to be. So it is a fairly tight crumb. That's why I'm saying like, it's not gonna be like a chiffon or angel food cake or anything like that. It's more like a banana bready cake. Um, but still looks, looks really good. And it's just chock full of fruit. And the nice thing is because it's a little bit thicker, the fruit stays nicely, um, spread out. It doesn't all fall to the bottom. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that brandy is really strong. <laughs> Maybe don't use as much brandy as I did. Maybe I should have put a little milk, bit of milk in there. I like it. But it's strong. Let me show you. I can <clears throat> around up here. how incorporated that fruit should be. See, it's, it's all very nicely incorporated, I guess. I'm saying the same word. Um, it was funny, we were watching The Great British Bake Off the other, <laughs> the other day and we've watched every episode. It was actually the 100th episode that Paul Hollywood had done, 100th episode of Great, Great British Bake Off. And never once has he used the term, what was the term? Uh, concertina in response to a cake. When you make a, a layer cake, sometimes, you know, they can get squished down or, or whatever. 
And so he used the, the term concertina, which is correct, you know, but he uses it like 20 times during the episode. Every time he's looking at a cake, oh, it didn't concertina or it did concertina. It's just funny. And I do the same thing. I'm like, I'm, I never use this word. And then all of a sudden I've just said incorporated like five times in a row because I'm not a human thesaurus. Um, <clears throat> it is what it is. Anyway, do we have any more questions? Because I think that we're, we're about out of time. About five minutes. How about five minutes. Let me know if you have questions, comments, concerns. Also, just a reminder that I would love to have some uh, <clears throat> suggestions on, on episodes for next year. Um, I've, I've got tons, but I want more, uh, you know, so as we go. I'm also going to keep trying to do these live streams maybe once a month or so. Um, and I just started uh, Patreon, my, my $10, 20 and $25 uh, patrons. We're getting together once a month and doing a cocktail hour. So we pick a historic cocktail and, you know, just chat about history and food. And it's, you know, a nice small, small gathering, uh, which is which is really lovely. Kind of, kind of nice to, to actually get to, because right now we're still doing it as like a Zoom. So we're, we're face to face actually talking with each other, which is, which is cool. You know, people sometimes bring up the 60s and 70s weird jello foods, but why do you kind of shy away from that? So a few reasons why I shy away from, really from foods from the, <clears throat> from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all of that. One reason is because uh, public domain. It's, I use a lot of images in my, in my videos, and if you use older images, they're public domain, I don't need permission, the later you get, it gets a little bit harder. Uh, so there's that, but it's also, it's, it's just not my, my fach, as, as musicians would say, it's not my, my wheelhouse. That said, I would actually love to try some of these, um, especially like the, the right post-World War II things um, and, and some of those 50s kind of weirder, the aspics and stuff like that. But there are other people who, who do that and they do that well. Um, I'm actually going to be, uh, I, I worked on the, the pumpkin pie episode. The one that I did is from the 1670s, but then I'll point you in the direction of uh, my friend Jill who has a channel called Yester Kitchen, where she really focuses on the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s American recipes, uh, kind of some of those weirder things. And she does a more modern pumpkin pie, I think, from the 60s. Um, so there are other people doing it, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. So uh, if, if that's something that people want to watch, I will do it. Uh, Etrigan joined late, but he wants Etrigan. to, <laughs> uh, after lockdown, maybe like a fan meet or greet. Some kind of get together. <clears throat> yeah, no. After lockdown, I, I mean, I would love to get to meet people and and have more of you know build that build that community and and travel. So you know we could do it in in several different places, which would be really cool. And then I would love you know they have cons like VidCon and and all of these different things where it just tends to have you know people get together. So it's kind of like a on purpose get together, I guess. Uh, so I hope to do those, um, but it's kind of like, when when is the world going to be back to normal? I don't know. Uh, this is the only world I know now because I've been doing this only since lockdown. So uh, Ian Crow sends us thanks. Uh, they're all gathered and suggests that for next year you do pierogies. I will do pierogies, and one of these days I'm going to do Jose's favorite thing that I make, which is. It's, it's not pierogies, but it's a little bit similar to pierogies in a way <clears throat> called birox. Uh, and the history behind the people who made them, the, uh, they were the Volga Germans who came over to Russia from Germany, invited by Catherine the Great. Such an interesting story. So I will be making those. They are amazing. They're basically ground beef, cabbage, uh, cheese, and onion kind of like cooked and then into the most pillowy soft dough that you have ever had in your life. It's like almost like Japanese milk bread, but filled with food. Oh, so good. And I will do that one of these days. 
Any more questions? Uh, Native American foods, food, some turkey. Yes, well, I was going to be doing saleb, which is from, from uh, Turkey, but one of the ingredients that was supposed to come never came. It's not legal in the United States to have it imported. And so I was having, a... anyway, that's, hopefully I'll be able to do that <laughs> eventually. And I do want to do some Turkish food. Uh, I, I actually love Turkish food. Um, and, and there's some interesting history and in how Turkish food in, in Germany actually be became a thing. Um, and Native American cuisine. I definitely want to, to do it. I'm still looking to partner with someone who really knows the history behind it a little bit more than I do because there hasn't been a lot written about it. And I'm, I, I feel like I could screw it up all too easily, especially because they didn't write down recipes. And so a lot of it you know, was, was transmitted orally and a lot of what we do have written down is not authentic. So I'm, I'm looking for people to work with. I have some names. I uh, just haven't gotten around to it, but it is on the docket. Sounds of Sushi sent you a Benjamin. Thank you, Sounds of Sushi. Appreciate that. And want more live streams. More live streams. Probably once a month. Um, I would like to do more, but this is actually <laughs> a lot of work. Um, and, you know, putting, putting each episode together is a lot of work. So unless they were just Q&As, which it could be, um, maybe a little bit of history. Uh, they'll probably have to stick to once a month, but maybe we have some of those where I'm not actually cooking a dish, which means I haven't had to develop a recipe because that's what takes a long time to do. Um, I'll try to get more, maybe after the new year. Probably a loaded question, but people want to know about the books you're using. <clears throat> the books I'm using, tons of books for, for this specifically. So this recipe came from Fanny Farmer's uh, 1896 cookbook. I also definitely went to, well, I went to that Amelia Simmons American cookery. And let me tell you, it was so frustrating because all online, if you look up election cake, everybody's using Amelia Simmons recipe. And then I have her book and it's not in there. And I was like, what is going on? Because a lot of times you find things online that are not true. So I was like, is this one of those things that isn't true? It's not actually her recipe. Turns out it's from the second uh, edition. So I don't have that. Very few people do, I guess. Um, but so I, I referenced her first edition as well for some of her techniques. Um, and then for this, I, I relied a lot on the uh, historical society, the Connecticut Historical Society, the New England Historical Society. They're not books, they're wonderful, you know, websites. And then the one book that I did really delve into is uh, Walter Woodward, I believe. The, the one that I mentioned, Creating Connecticut, it's fantastic. Um, really just some interesting stuff. He knows Connecticut history like the back of his hand. Um, really interesting guy. Outside of that, you know, I have tons of cookbooks that I rely on, but a lot of what I try to do is find primary sources. And the best way to do that is by, there are some online and, and sometimes I have trouble because they're behind paywalls or you have to belong to a university or something like that. Um, but a lot of online, like, I don't know how to say it, JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R is one website that has all of these uh, academic papers. And if you read in the academic paper and then go to the bibliography, they often have their sources and sometimes those are primary sources. So I'll pick up, you know, one of these uh, articles and go straight to the bibliography and be like, okay, where are you getting your, where are you getting your stuff? And then I go find that stuff either online or, or have it sent to me. And then a lot of books lately, I've been having viewers sent to me, which has been really awesome. I've had several recipes that I've already done and several more that I'm going to be doing the makshufa, uh, the, um, Arabic candy was one of them. Um, so tons of places, lots and lots of places. The chat is asking about armored turnips. Do you know what those are? Armored turnips. You know what? I've heard of that, but I don't know what that is. I don't. I'm going to look it up. Armored turnips. Um, too Far Doug asks, are there any drunken toasts or quotes from your research on election day? Drunken toasts or quotes. You know what? If I'd come across any, they would have uh, been in the episode. Would have been a nice way to close things out. I didn't come across anything. They didn't write it down, you know, which is okay. What they did write down were these long sermons. So 
but they're not. I don't think they're drunken. They didn't drink. And that's it. Good place to wrap up. All right. Well, there is election cake. Wonderful history behind it. Wonderful history about our elections and, you know, how they've changed. And you should definitely go out. Vote on Tuesday if you haven't already. I think most people already have. Um, and I'll see you on Tuesday for an episode of Tasting History. Thank you, everyone. Till next time. <laughs>